the term Kabbalah yes. has a lot of appeal yes. in the general market. I'm, I'm not sure if the general market really knows its true meaning, and you are a fan of okay. definitions and terms. Would you, sure. let's just start with, what, what, what is Kabbalah? Can we define it? I'm David Kaplan. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I am married with two children. I work in marketing. And I like to say that I'm a chassid in training. Wonderful. I'm Label Wolf. I hail from Australia, although I was born in Poland. I'm a child of Holocaust survivors, raised in Australia from the age of two and a half and uh, most recently founded a rather creative Beit Chabad called Spirit Grow, which emphasizes uh, wellness of mind and spirit. Well, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Where, where Label Wolf has ended up in the, in the realm of spirituality and maybe by others have defined you as a, a great Kabbalist, yes. the, 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 the term Kabbalah yes. has um, a lot of appeal yes. in the general market. Yes. And I, I'm, I'm not sure if the general market really knows its true meaning, and you are a fan of okay. d definitions and terms. Would you, sure. let's just start with, what, what, what is Kabbalah? Can we define it? All right, firstly, it certainly became a buzzword. Um, when Madonna adopts it, it must have some general relevancy. Um, and I think it was that general quest for meaning and spirituality that people's quest looked for a Jewish equivalent of something which is concurrently spiritual and contemporary while being ancient at the same time. The word Kabbalah fitted perfectly what was the fairly superficial perception of what it was. In truth, Kabbalah simply means the process of receiving. When Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moses came down from Har Sinai and taught the Torah, he taught it at four distinct levels. All of us there, you were there, I was there, that's where we met for the first time. You don't remember? Uh, I don't remember. I, I okay. do, we, 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 we have met there. though, we were there. for sure. Okay, so he taught Moshe Rabbeinu taught everyone the basic meaning of the Torah. That's called Pshat. Then he took a smaller grouping of people and taught them a deeper level. And that became known as Remez. Remez means hint or allusion, whereas Pshat means plain meaning. So smaller group, deeper, allusion. Then he took an even smaller grouping of people and taught them the Drush level. Drush is meaning it's so profound that I have to move away from the subject matter for you to understand it, which seems like a strange thing to say. So I'll give you an example from uh, Albert Einstein. A young man approaches Albert Einstein and says, teach me the theory of relativity. So Einstein asks him, have you studied any math? No. Physics? No. So Einstein says, no problem, I'll teach it to you. It goes like this. If you're sitting on a sofa with your girlfriend for 10 minutes, it'll feel like a mere 10 seconds. But if you're sitting on a very hot stove for 10 seconds, it'll feel like a full 10 minutes. He says, that's relativity, okay? That's what drush is. Drush is to move away from the subject matter, use some analog, more truly analogy, metaphor, and then come back. That's why the Midrashic literature is full of anecdotes and stories, quaint stories, which some people say, that's childlike. It's not childlike, it's a veneer for immense depth. And then finally, and now getting to your question, Moshe Rabbeinu taught the fourth level, which was known as Sod. The word Sod in Hebrew means secret. It's where reality is abstracted into forces and uh, uh, energetic correlations that lead to creation and speak in terms of the animation of the world and the like and the multi-worlds. All right, 
and that big tradition was passed on singularly from teacher to student. The student received the teaching, the Hebrew infinitive to receive, le kabel, the noun kabbalah. So that's where the word originates from. But that became a subterranean secretive tradition for reasons which I'll share until we find ourselves in the third century. And in the third century, it becomes codified in the person of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He codifies it, the first written down version. But it doesn't become published till another 900 to 1,000 years later by Moses de Leon. And he calls that work the Zohar. So you've got now a further publication of it. But even then, it remains a very, very limited tradition until we move to the uh, uh, 17th century in Sfat, Israel, where the mystics start to study it in groups. So it's a little bit wider. And then finally, the Baal Shem Tov comes along and he popularizes the teachings of it, but still only broad strokes. And finally, the al Rebbe, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe comes, and he makes it intelligible through analysis and explanation so that everyone is able to understand it. And that's what Chabad Hasidism does to Kabbalah. Because Kabbalah as itself, the Zohar is inscrutable. It's codified. There's no way. So, a long answer to a short question. So when people became enamored by Kabbalah in the uh, 1970s and 80s, etc., et um, it was an illusion that they became enamored to. But it was something that they felt was important. But I think that uh, go those who were genuine searched behind the popularity of the superficial and discovered Chabad Chassidus and therefore genuinely began to understand what it was that Moses taught at the fourth level at Mount Sinai. So maybe that's, that's one of the answers, because in, in reality, Kabbalah is the inner workings of the Torah. Yes. Okay? It's not for beginners, no. though, though you know, beginners or just people that are curious are searching for meaning, and they, they in their minds thought, well, this is a nice venue to capture that. But maybe the answer is instead of grasping it at concepts that they don't really understand, you, you're, 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 in your last sentence, I think you said, hey, maybe, maybe come to the Kabbat house mm. where, they teach, sure. they, where they teach this as, you know, as part of holistic Jewish Absolutely learnings. correct. But as perhaps I would just uh, place a different nuance on one of the things that you said when you said it's not for beginners. You see, it's important to meet people at the level they're at. Once upon a time, even a mere hundred years ago, yeah, it was a graduated evolution. You went to Cheder in the Shtetl in uh, Poland or uh, wherever you were, and you studied Aleph Beis, and you got to learn Chumash, etc. Then you progressed to Mishnah, and then when you progressed to Gemara, and then you progressed to the analytics of it, etc., etc. We're not in that world anymore. Not because we're not in the Shtetl, but we're a completely different world where the majority of Jewish people are disconnected from their Judaism. Now that's a phenomenon that's possibly unique in history. Now therefore, a quite a different strategic approach needs to be employed in the way that we connect and relate to Jewish people who are disconnected from the roots and may not even have interests as such. So when I say it's not, f when you say it's not for beginners, I find that we're talking today to a mature age audience whose intellectual prowess is developed, whose curiosity levels may be peaked, and therefore you have to speak in sophisticated terms. And therefore I find no problems starting with the depth of Judaism, which is teasingly attractive to speak, especially today in a world that tends to wish to be spiritual 
Although the word spiritual today with small s means so many, means so many things, you know, ecological concern, environmental concern, non-animal testing, meditation, mindfulness, uh, you name it. This is all under small s spirituality, but it does include spirituality as well. Um, and therefore, start where they're interested and work your way back to the Aleph base. So it's the exact reverse process of what perhaps traditionally has always been Jewish education. So I think it is for the beginners in this day and age. I, I'm going to validate that. I'm going to validate okay. and support it. You've, you've, you've influenced me. You won me over because what, what I see with my friends and colleagues who a lot of them have been disconnected with Judaism and maybe still some are, is they, they have a, a deep interest in the spiritual side, you know, who am I? Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Is there sure. a God? Sure. Why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah. And they're less interested in the basics. Th yeah. <laughs> uh, when do I stand up? <laughs> the when do's and do's and yeah. in, the, in shul. Um, so I guess it's more of a comment than a question. I guess I want to validate and uh, endorse what you're saying. Sure. And I'm, that's been my experience. That's been my experience with, with my colleagues in the. I, I call them beginners, that's probably not a fair term, just those right. who are curious, those who are curious and sure. aren't as observant as, as others. I think that one of the things that I have to be careful of is not to emulate the wider community sense of spiritual interest, meaning many spiritual teachers and many traditions remain at the airy-fairy spiritual level. Whereas Jewish spirituality tries to bring you back to earth. And by that I mean is, yeah, you can fascinate people with the acrobatics of spirituality and Kabbalah and things like that. But you have to also allow that to reach the ordinary, everyday, mundane level of the world and to be able to lift that to a point of interest that it too is spiritual. Like, for example, I'm, uh, I'm writing a book right now, which is basically 24 hours in the life of a spiritual Jew. I want to demonstrate that waking up is a spiritual experience. Washing is a spiritual experience. Dressing is a spiritual experience. Eating, etc. And I take the, the reader back to all those. And yes, I do endorse the high level abstract spirituality but i want to relate it to the ordinary why do you move your hands in this way why do you do things in right and left and up and down and why do you have layers of clothing and what etc etc all of it and it's meaningful Right. Why do we put on our right shoe first if that if i right shoe first and tie the left uh, shoelace first Yes, yeah. <laughs> so Which many I, people will laugh at, and yet it's got very profound spiritual implications. Right, which I'm just learning, but I knew, I knew there was, there, there's, Judaism has a position on everything, down to how you should put your shoes on. But to interrupt you, it has to. Why? Because everything has been created, and therefore there's an animating force for everything in existence which is another way of saying that everything is meaningful. And therefore, if we can, as a human analog, align to the meaningfulness of creation, then we're actually emulating the creative force. Everything has meaning. Every person that we meet has meaning. Every action, every yes. experience, down to putting on your shoes. Exactly. Okay, awesome. So. I want to tap into something you said just a little bit earlier sure. about um, something that you do in your lectures, yes. which is to you take take concepts, which I would call complex concepts, and make it understandable to the everyman. And I want to ask you a specific question next about venting. Yes, because I think it's you have a powerful message to share there. Yes. But I do want to ask you first. What is the primary message you seek to convey in your, maybe your lectures as a whole, or maybe even just the individual lectures, like on mindfulness or yeah. anger? It's not an easy question to answer. Um, 
I think it's probably integration, unification, that no matter what the lecture is, what the subject matter is, it's somewhere on the circumference where all radii point to a common center. In other words, I may be speaking about uh, meditation and mindfulness, and people expect me therefore, therefore to be able to teach techniques of meditation, but I will ask them, why meditate? What's it, just because everyone's saying, oh, you have to meditate, but why? It's just another technology of human endeavor. If it doesn't have a goal, if it doesn't have a purpose, if it isn't part of your total mission, why do it? It isn't an end in its own right. It's only a pathway to something more. So meditate, you have a goal, for example, his Boinunus is a very traditional form of uh, Chabad Hasidic meditation. What is it? It's to take a wisdom teaching and integrate it with yourself so you become a living exposition of that teaching. So that that day, that wisdom teaching becomes practiced. That's one format of meditation. Another format of meditation is a more common one, and that is health of the body. Uh, the body is the vehicle for the expression, it's the technology for the expression of the energy of the soul. If the body's not intact, then the neshama can't express optimally. So it's a very special thing to keep the body in good shape, whether that's with eating practices or whether it's with uh, exercise practices, but also most importantly with consciousness practices. In other words, what's the ambience of our inner being? If it's not a sense of emunah and bitachon, faith and trust, then we're open to the vagaries of economic uncertainty, geopolitical uh, conflict and violence, um, interpersonal quarrelsome natures, um, and everything else. Now, how do you overcome that? So some people say, oh, well, that's reality. You've got to live with it. But that's not true. It's how you view it. It's how you frame reality. It's how you interpret it. And if you can interpret it positively rather than negatively, it makes a huge difference, not just in your quality of life, but the health of your body. Because as we know full well, our mindset is translated down to the cellular level of the body, to the chemistry of the body. And even things as vague as feeling confident in the presence of one's therapist already is a healing process for yourself as a patient or as a client. So all these things are so terribly important in context of what it is that we're able to seek. So coming back to your question, which was quite different, like I speak about different subjects and what would be the primary uh, 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 a mission or message that I want to give is that everything is interrelated and everything's part of what we call achdus, echad, oneness. And therefore, everything that happens to us in life is related appropriately to every cir circumstance that we happen to be living in in the world at that moment. Feel comfortable. You're part of the plan but we're also the wild card of uh, uh, creation because we have free choice. And that's another subject, choose wisely. Sure. The oneness, right? That, yeah. If you had asked me what's the, what's the comprehensive message, it would, and that bitachon yes. and amuna, that mm -hmm. there is only good, there is only good. Ultimately, there's Ultimately, only good. Ultimately, even though it's, sometimes it's difficult. Painful. Yes. And as you stated in your lecture, you know, if bad things are, you know, um, tragic things are occurring, we should not accept them. We should be sad and cry on the shoulders of those who are suffering. We should, but at the same time, have an underlying sense of reality. There's somehow or other a redeeming virtue, which we cannot see, we cannot understand, but having that as a residual in the back of our mind and believing it, completely reframes the circumstances. Indeed. Thank mm -hmm. you.